Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the webinar on water and environmental modeling using OpenFOAM. Uh, we are really uh, happy and encouraged to do such webinars after uh, receiving such a, such a large amount of uh, interest uh, from, from you guys. We got almost uh, 1000 registrations for this webinar and I hope uh, we'll be able to deliver on, on, on all the work that we have done. Uh, let's start with a little bit of introduction about myself. My name is Advait Gupta and uh, this is a history, uh, my, my previous work experience, my education uh, about, uh, uh, about how I got into computational fluid dynamics. So I have a bachelor's degree from NIT Warangal uh, in civil engineering followed by two years of field job uh, as, a, as, a, as a civil engineer uh, followed by master's degree at Stanford. Uh, that's where uh, I mainly uh, picked up computational fluid dynamics, scientific computing, and artificial intelligence. Uh, after that, I worked for five years in a in a CFD software development company uh, in the USA as a senior CFD engineer, a source code developer, a technical blog blogger, and I was also the head of global academic programs. Uh, I, I moved back to India last year and uh, since then I've been serving as the founder and CEO of uh, Pandav Applications and, and I mainly uh, work with business development and R&D side of things. Okay, so in today's uh, webinar we'll be focusing on five main topics. Uh, we'll start with introduction to Pandav Applications. Uh, why, why do we need to model water and environmental processes? Uh, then we'll talk about different methods, physics, uh, processes uh, that can be modeled uh, using OpenFOAM, uh, some upcoming webinars and workshops uh, that will be conducted by Pandav. So Pandav was registered uh, last year uh, under the Companies Act of India. Uh, and our current team consists of a couple of CFD, uh, R &D, CFD software developers in the R&D team, a few application engineers and myself. Uh, the main technology that we work on is computational fluid dynamics, but we also work on tangential technologies such as artificial intelligence, design and parameter optimization. And uh, we have also gotten involved in some innovation and prototyping uh, for mechanical and electronic designs. Uh, the industries that we operate are in wat water, environmental, 3D printing, aerospace, energy, defense, microfluidics, consumer products, uh, automotive and railways, and we are also getting into healthcare industry. Our, our business model is, is pretty straightforward. We do everything which is related to open foam and, and technology in general. So we help organizations migrate to open foam. Uh, we do direct CFD consulting projects. CFD training and workshops. Uh, we also have a CFD experts marketplace. So if you are a if you are a modeler, if you are a simulation engineer, you can sign up on on this marketplace, which is at www.pandav.com, and uh, you can you can work on projects directly. Uh, we like I mentioned, we also work on uh, AI and optimization related projects and and product design, technology development, and prototyping. Uh, this is our portfolio in terms of the industries that we operate on, but today's webinar will be dedicated to the very first industry, which is water and environmental. Okay, so we, we, what, what we want to attain with all this, uh, setting, up this uh, setting up this company has a, has a goal. So we want to create a standalone CFD application, and we also want to do dedicated consulting for water and environmental research and industry. Keeping these four important principles in mind, we want all our work, all our applications, all our R&D to be academically and industrially compatible. We want to keep them low cost, uh, and and for that we we, we are using OpenFOAM. Uh, we want to keep it seriously scalable, especially when you have a lot of computational power at your disposal these days with cloud computing. And and of course we want we want to validate uh, all our models, all our development work and make sure that they are actually accurate. Uh, this, is, this is the latest addition to our portfolio of work that we do. Uh, complete engineering design, development, testing, innovation, and low cost prototyping. So what you see here is, uh, is a module, uh, 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 
a thermoelectrical module that basically uh, converts uh, changes the temperature of uh, water from from hot to cold and cold to hot and uh, and we we will eventually release it out in multiple applications down the line uh, we are located in the northern part of india uh, near the foothills of himalayas and you can reach us at support at pandav.com or you can check out our website at www.pandav.com and for any company updates, uh, company uh, information, our new simulation videos, uh, you can visit our LinkedIn page as well. Okay. So why should we model water and environmental processes? Uh, when I was putting together the slides for, for this particular section of the webinar, there was, there was a lot of information, but I found that, uh, that uh, the United Nations page has a very concise but uh, very impactful information as to what is the state of water and environmental uh, engineering around the world right now or, or the problems that we face in this in this special domain. Okay. Uh, as we all know, uh, over 1.7 billion people uh, or, or many, many people uh, around the world live near the rivers, uh, water bodies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the amount of consumption exceeds uh, the recharge. Uh, this leads to desiccation of rivers, depletion of groundwater, and degradation of ecosystems. The, the next big problem is uh, as, as countries are developing and the populations are increasing, uh, more and more countries are falling into the category of water stress countries. Uh, in fact, uh, it is projected that by two 2025, two thirds of world's population could all already be living in a water, water stressed country. <clears throat> Uh, the next, this, this uh, economic loss from the inadequate delivery of water, uh, this is very relevant to our webinar today. Uh, what they mean by inadequate delivery of water is basically moving a certain amount of water from point A to point B in the most effective way possible. And as per, as per World Health Organization's study, uh, we are not doing it in, a, in, a, in the most efficient way as of now. This is also very relevant to the webinar, uh, directly relevant to the webinar today, that 80% of the wastewater is discharged without treatment. Uh, the, the wastewater could be uh, regular sewage water, it could be industrial discharge, it could be uh, you know, marine discharge, fuel discharge, petrochemical discharge. But in short, 80% of the wastewater is, is discharged without treatment into the, into the uh, rivers. The next one is uh, we we are all experiencing it at some some in some way or the other. Uh, water related disasters are are huge, uh, especially in the last one decade. Uh, you know we are seeing more and more disasters that are causing loss to economy and and social infrastructure social social infrastructure of countries. Uh, since 1992, uh, droughts and storms have affected 4.2 billion people, which is more than half of the world's population, and caused a lot of uh, damage uh, to both uh, life and property. Uh, what you see in the bottom two images are, are the flood images, but I wanted to put uh, an image on one of the more recent type of disasters called uh, tailing dam failures. Uh, these happen when a mining uh, mining uh, waste waste of a mining uh, activity or a mining pond collapses uh, and, 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 and the pond breaks down and instead of water flooding out from the pond uh, you, you have you have uh, hazardous and, uh, and poisonous chemical waste which actually floods the downstream. So how can how can CFD uh, help in all this so before before, uh, moving on to how can CFD help, let's let's uh, elaborate on what CFD is in, in, in few words. So CFD means computational fluid dynamics, and typically it means a full 3D simulation of real world processes using the principles of physics and, and computing power. So for water environmental applications, uh, it, has, it, has, it has a lot of impact. Uh, it can for example, it can help in predicting time and extent of catastrophic events. Uh, it can help in improving old and creating new efficient hydraulic, coastal, river, civil, and civil engineering systems. Uh, most of our civil engineering uh, 
infrastructure is is decades old if not 50 years old and uh, which is kind of going out of context with our current requirements uh, we can design and optimize water treatment processes uh, as as i said 80 percent of the water uh, is untreated and put back into the into, into the clean water and uh, lastly understanding community impact of building man-made structures and preservation especially in the case of dams so when you construct a dam uh, it co it can it can uh, negatively impact the downstream communities so how can we model water environmental processes using open foam uh, water and environmental processes can be broken down into five main physics uh, and and what you see on this pyramid at the bottom of this pyramid is the most important aspect which is interface tracking of fluids with turbulence so interface uh, literally means that uh, it's an interface between two fluids so typically in water and environmental processes you have air and water and there's a there's a interface formed between these two but uh, you know it, it, it's not always the case that you have only air and water involved in a in, a, in an environmental process you can have water air slurry mining waste oil spills and uh, typically uh, the way these these different fluids interact with each other are not very uh, calm in nature they can be turbulent and that's why it's, it's important to capture the turbulence as well uh, the second part of this pyramid is interaction with solid structures uh, fluids often interact with civil and natural structures such as bridges uh, bridge piers especially dams spillways and shippers so it is important to have accurate modeling software to to be able to uh, capture this interaction between uh, fluid and solid structures third one is about sedimentation is covering very relevant to uh, bridge piers especially or any other solid structures because this is covering activity or the removal of sand or removal of soil from near a man-made structure can lead to uh, can lead to uh, structural disintegrity of a, of a man-made structure fourth one and fifth one they are becoming more relevant in the current times the fourth one relates to biochemical reactions uh, especially we encounter these biochemical reactions in in wastewater treatment plants where multiple fluids react with each other and with biological matter and they create multiple products uh, from such reactions and at the same time you have heat transfer going on you have mass transfer you have uh, thermodynamics and, and fluid dynamics surface tension so, so there's a lot of activity going on so as we as we move up on this pyramid uh, we, we get into more and more complex sort of uh, simulations last one is uh, non-newtonian flows which is the topmost part of the pyramid uh, this has become very relevant in the recent uh, because of the recent uh, events of of tailings dam failures um, so what we mean by non-newtonian fluids is is you know they they do not behave like regular fluids uh, for example uh, slurry it's it's not really behaves like water uh, when it comes to fluid fluid properties so when we say non-newtonian fluids that's what we mean by it there are a lot of uh, choices for cfd software uh, to choose from but we but we exclusively work with open foam and and there's a reason why uh, why we do so uh, that i'll be explaining in the next few, few slides uh, open foam also comes with paraview and a snappy hex mesh uh, paraview is a data visualization visualizer uh, it is a state of the art data visualizer and snappy hex mesh is a meshing software which basically relates to how you can set up your simulations or run simulations in open foam okay so why 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 do we work with open foam because uh, you know sticking to our original principles of keeping uh, cft modeling low cost and accurate uh, that is these are both possible at the same time with open foam it's low cost simply because uh, there is no cost of the software involved it's open source uh, and it's accurate because of large amount of intense validations uh, done around the globe using open foam on or using open foam on real world processes it has a large users community of experts around the globe in fact if you go to cftonline.com you'll find uh, 
30,000 to 50,000 healthy threads on open foam, if, if I remember correctly, indicating uh, which is at par with, with some of the commercial software and, and indicates presence of a good healthy uh, community around the globe. Next one is the scalable on cloud for faster turnaround times. Uh, while, while most software are scalable on cloud, but there is an advantage with using, of using open foam. Uh, so if you get a if you get a paid software, you might be limited by the number of cores, number of processors that you can run your software on. For example, if if you get a software with sixteen cores uh, or a, or a capability to run on sixteen cores, and if you happen to have a cluster which has thousand cores, you won't be able to utilize cores more than sixteen. But if you use OpenFoam, you can run it on all thousand cores because it is it is open source. And there's no there's no licensing issues there. It's customizable, uh, which is important both for academia and industry, with more and more cutting edge sort of uh, products and technologies coming out. Uh, simulations are also becoming cutting edge, and uh, it, it becomes important that that you can uh, simulate exactly what you want for your process. So so this is a big and especially for researchers students. Uh, you know, faculty and people in academia, I mean, this learning, doing CFD through OpenFOAM makes you a better CFD engineer simply because you can actually see the source code, you can change the source code. And then lastly, state-of-the-art visualization using Paraview, uh, like I mentioned, and you will be seeing a lot of videos and images uh, coming out of Paraview in the upcoming slides. Okay, so here what we see is just just an indication of why I call it a state of art post processing, uh, because of uh, this this animation here we have we have nacelle of a wind wind uh, wind turbine. A nacelle is where you have your generator, your fluid coupling, uh, you have your shaft, and and all the ducts for for uh, heat transfer and and this is all uh, simulated using open form, but what you can see on the screen here is generated using Paraview. This is another example of, of uh, state of art visualization using, uh, using Paraview. What you have is a train, uh, for those of you who are Indians will know this is a six coach Rajasthani Express and uh, we have put this train inside a tunnel uh, due to the upcoming uh, we were we were inspired by the upcoming project by Indian government on uh, building world's highest railway line, uh, which will mostly be inside the tunnels. So nevertheless, uh, we we just wanted to simulate and see how it looks. And uh, what you see here is is uh, is the velocity profile of of the train uh, while it's inside the tunnel. Okay, uh, so remember the five main physics that I mentioned, and I'll go through each of these physics, the relevant application to industries, and I will start with uh, interface tracking with, with turbulence. So what you see on this screen are a couple of examples of, of interface tracking or where interfaces are important. So what you see on the top left screen is a, top left uh, of this screen is a spray nozzle, and uh, what we are spraying is water vapor and uh, and the interface between the water vapor and the air requires interface tracking uh, in the top center of the screen you have uh, oil air water separator so this time you have three phases and uh, there are multiple interfaces there's an interface between oil and water interface between water and air an interface between oil and air and we, we need to track all these three interfaces. On the top right and bottom right of the screen, uh, you have a kind of water falling into two different geometric shapes. And then here you want to keep, in, keep track of the interface between water and air. On the bottom center uh, of the screen, uh, this is quite complicated. It's actually a simulation of uh, 3D printing uh, where we are hitting laser on a solid metal. The solid map, some of the solid metal vaporizes, some of the solid metal uh, turns into liquid, some of the liquid vaporizes, and then you have air as well. So you have many, many interfaces to keep track of. Again, uh, these are some of the animations. Uh, they explain the interface tracking uh, better. 
uh, better than the images. You can see how the air and water uh, are interacting and how air is entraining inside the water, the circulations, the formation of the pool. <clears throat> so what we saw were one, one or two phase uh, interface trackings. What we have here on this screen is three phase oil air water separator that I explained earlier. And then we have four phase selective uh, laser melting simulation where we have liquid metal, metal vapor, solid metal which is stainless steel alloy and inert air. Okay, a little bit of history and current updates on, on interface tracking um, R&D or solvers. So, so the first solver was introduced 40 years ago, the first interface tracking solver called volume of fluid method. And then we, and then along the line, uh, we had level set method, hybrid WAF, which is a mix of WAF method and level set method. And then in the last few years, in 2018, 2019, and 2020, we had more of these uh, advanced WAF methods. And the, when we'll see that over years, the accuracy or the accuracy of these solvers has, has improved. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we are not limited to just two phases uh, using open foam. We can do n number of phases, and uh, this is a really big advantage over, over other CFD software. Overall, uh, from our own validations that we have run on water drops, waves, hydraulics, ship hulls, and bubble rise simulations, we have found that uh, there's been a gain of 3% accuracy uh, over the last few decades uh, as you move to from, from traditional WAF method towards more advanced WAF uh, methods. And uh, while this, may, this number may sound small, but when you apply it to real world scenarios uh, where, where loss of property and life is at a stake, this, this percentage is a huge number. Uh, the last thing uh, is, is the ratio of water and air densities. So the density of water is 1000 uh, kilograms per meter cube and the density of air is 1.25. Uh, kilograms per meter cube and the ratio is 800 and many of the water environmental processes have an interface where you have water on one side and air on the other side and right at the interface you have this big ratio of 800 right and this is this is not very good for so typical uh, let's put it this way that this is typical typical solvers are not that great at capturing this large of a ratio difference at the interfaces so what we have done we have modified and updated the traditional k omega turbulence model for high for high density uh, ratios and we have found that that the that we have uh, we are getting better results uh, for such simulations okay uh, let, now let's look at some of the simulations uh, in this interface uh, uh, tracking uh, category interface tracking physics so we have all seen vertical drops in our life a few times uh, Vertical drop from in, in a river is very common in an artificial staircase, vertical drop from a weir, or it could just be, you know, vertical cascade of, of water uh, falling through multiple rock structures in a, in a river. Um, so one thing that, that is at heart, uh, that we keep at heart at, at Pandav applications is thorough validation. We don't want to give out any 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 data without validating. Uh, so what we did, we picked up an, some experimental data collected by Professor Raj Ratnam from University of Alberta almost 25 years ago, but it's a very extensive collection of data on a very simple yet complicated uh, process where you have a, a stream of water falling over, uh, falling over a step. Right. And, uh, and there's a lot of physics that's happening here, a lot of dimensions to keep track of. For example, the height of the pool, the length of the pool which is formed downstream, the angle of the nape, the velocity of water at the exit, uh, you know, velocity of the water at the entry, and, and the angle of the free falling jet or nape. Uh, so what we did, we validated this using, using open foam and some of the some of the solver upgrades that have been done over the last few years and this is this is what we find that if you use traditional WAF method uh, which was developed around 1980 uh, the average error in the pool dimensions is around six percent 
but as you move towards 2019 2020 this average error drops down by a few percent uh, two percent if you take geometric WAF one and uh, just again want to elaborate on the differences in the three simulations here the next validation is bubble rise again a very standard problem for validating CFD solvers so what you have on the right image here is A1, A4, A6, A8, and these are basically four different shapes of a bubble, air bubble rising in a column of water. And the reason why the shape of this air bubble varies is, is based on the surface tension, viscosity differences, and, 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 the, and the velocity at which they are injected. Uh, they all start off as spheres, but then uh, by, the, by the end, by the time they rise to the top of the liquid column, their shapes change. So we validated this model as well uh, using OpenFORM and again we found some interesting results. So using traditional uh, interface uh, or WAF method which came out in 1980, uh, the error percentage were quite high, around 20% almost. But with, with newer uh, WAF methods, the errors have reduced by 3 to 4%. And, and it's not just the accuracy gain that we see, we also see that newer interface tracking solvers give better, uh, uh, faster, faster uh, simulation results as well. Okay, moving on to interaction with solid structure. So what we have, uh, so this is the second physics, second pool of physics, uh, remember from that pyramid. Uh, so what we have on top left is, is uh, Dibang Valley, which is situated in the Arunachal Pradesh state of India, and uh, the government of India is constructing world's tallest uh, concrete gravity dam there mm, and and they want to do this to prevent uh, downstream flooding as well as uh, provide electricity to the local people um, what you have on top right is uh, a drop shaft structure and we'll explain more on that it basically falls into the category of municipal hydraulics then what you have on bottom right is a is a ship with fuel tanks inside it and bottom left is a simple uh, DTC hull of a, of a boat or a ship. Okay, let's start with flood routing or flow routing first, uh, which basically means uh, if, you, if you know what is the flow rate of water or the height of water at point A in your river, uh, you want to predict based on just that information what will be the flow rate or height of water at point B in the river. And this is of importance because uh, you want to make uh, long-term and short-term decisions based on, based on this data to avoid life and property loss. Uh, routing is also used uh, to demonstrate how reservoir of fluid retention basin will affect the volume of water downstream uh, after a storm. Okay, so if you carefully observe this observation, uh, this, this simulation, you'll see uh, that's so so the top right let me pause this video the top right image uh, is the actual meander of the river and this is the proposed location the arrow shows the proposed location of dam and what we did we picked out the exact terrain uh, from from google earth and we put a dam uh, the proposed dam in there which is not constructed yet uh, but we already put a dam in our computer model and then we make a reservoir before and the upstream of the dam and we open three gates uh, from the dam and, and let the water come out. And then we can see the spread of water as it goes downstream. Yeah. Uh, VS are, again, this is something that we may have seen, uh, we may have seen in a few times uh, in our life. Uh, Weirs. They are used for regulating flow conditions and water levels. They are used for intercepting sediment, especially when your rivers carry large amount of silt uh, and soil with it. Uh, you don't want them as they move more and more towards downstream. There's a potential of sediment accumulation. Uh, and then for reducing channel slope, uh, for stabilizing channel bed of a river or a stream. So what, what, we, what we show here is uh, it's a very simple simulation, uh, but you'll get the idea. Uh, let me play it from the beginning again. You have a simple trapezoidal wear with, with uh, water overflowing, and you can see the, the shape of the falling 
nape is quite accurately captured. The second wear is slightly different. You have waves in the upstream part of the wear and then, and then there's a overflow from there. Uh, next important simulation in this category is municipality stormwater draft, drop shafts. So drop shafts are used to reduce the kinetic energy of water. And why do you want to do that? Because uh, the underground uh, tunnels that carry storm water, uh, they are typically connected by the over the ground tunnels using a vertical, vertical uh, tunnel or we call it drop shaft. And the idea is you don't want all your volume of water, all that mass of water falling directly into the tunnel. So you make, you make these type of baffle structures. And if you look at the, if you look at the animation, you'll understand the water is not falling directly from the top pipe to the bottom pipe. It's kind of cascading down uh, through the baffles, falling from one baffle to another baffle, and then all the way to the bottom. Let me play this video again. Uh, this is another simulation of, of a drop shaft. Uh, this indicates clearly how the velocity structures and, and, the, and the volume of water is moving, moving down the drop shaft. Shapels are important for uh, coastal engineers um, where they want to understand the resistance force on the, on the, on the ship hull. There could be six degrees of freedom uh, that can be acting on a DTC hull. And what we do here is, is do a simple validation on, on, a, on a hull shape or a, on a ship. And we find that the net resistance force that was calculated from experiments is 32.5 Newtons. And what we get from simulation results is 33.6 Newtons. And this is using the standard, uh, standard uh, solvers in, in open form. And we are all currently working on uh, some advanced techniques such as immersed boundary method uh, to further improve the accuracy of, of calculating uh, forces on, on solid structures by, by, by the fluid around them. Uh, sloshing in a tank is a common occurrence in a spacecraft tanks, uh, ships and trucks. And uh, we have done some validation work or we have simulated some of that as well. So what you see in the left half of the animation is a six degree of freedom that is surge, sway, heave, roll, pitch and yaw. And on the right half of the animation you see three degrees of freedom which is roll, pitch and yaw. And you can see how the water is uh, water is uh, sloshing around in, in, in the two different scenarios. Another one is wave motion, which is basically propagation of energy without displacement of matter from one point to another. So it may seem that waves actually displace uh, matter from one point to another, but not really. Uh, they just displace energy from point A to point B. And uh, what we want to show uh, from this, again, simple simulation. So it's, it's easy, it's easy uh, to just simulate air, which is a yellow part, or just simulate water, which is a blue part. but but the interface between the air and, and, the, and the water, which is on the right half of the animation, that's where the challenge is. And you can see that it, we can nicely capture the wave, wave motion, which, which we see uh, between air and water interface. Uh, next one is floating bodies. So there are many advantages of using floating structures versus uh, permanent structures these days. Uh, they do not cause damage to uh, marine ecosystems. They do not cause silt deposition. They do not disrupt ocean currents. Uh, and uh, their installation is rapid. You basically bring them from somewhere, install them on site. And they're, they're also relatively more immune to seismic, uh, seismic shocks. So another simple validation uh, showing a pontoon bridge or a simple bridge, uh, how it floats over over a, over a water body the next category of physics i want to discuss is scouring and sedimentation and uh, this this is perhaps the most challenging uh, physics that that 
uh, we simulate or engineers around the world try to simulate. So, and, and the reason for that is you don't have just fluids involved in these simulations, you also have solid structures. Uh, and then you also have silt or, or, or soil, which has different properties uh, from fluids or solids. And you want to simulate all these three at the same time. So what you see on the bottom left image or the bottom uh, center image is around the piers. So these are the piers of the bridges. You can see that there is some scouring that has happened and this is bad for the structural integrity of, of a structure. And we, we did a validation on this case as well. Uh, but, but before that, uh, I, I want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on sediment scour. Uh, so typically it's removal of sediment such as sand and gravel from around bridge abutments or piers. And this results in channel uh, stream channel stability uh, or, or the instability in the bridge piers. And then this, this can vary a lot based on the velocity of the water and the angle of the water at which the, it's hitting, hitting the pier. Um, yeah, and, and all this eventually leads to, to uh, reducing the life of your bridge piers and, and results in expenses, uh, financial expenses on the part of the constructor or, or the government agency. We have a validation here again uh, to show how how our simulation does in comparison to some of the experimental results uh, reported in literature. So what you have is a streamlined pier. So our pier is not a simple shape. Streamlined piers are considered to be the best shapes for piers from sediment discovering perspective. So if you have a sediment, if you have a pier which is like this stream shape. Uh, you have and, and you have water moving around it at a velocity of 0.3 meters per second. Uh, both experiment and our open form simulation results indicate that the maximum depth of a scour that we should be observing is around 3 centimeters. So I'll play this video again and if you keep an eye on the bottom half of this animation you'll see that the that the river bed this there's a there's a scour formation on the river bed. Let me play it one more time. And what you have on the top half of the animation is, is the velocity structures or the sediment transport velocity around the, around the streamlined pier structure. The next one uh, is, uh, is, is quite complicated again. Uh, like I mentioned, it's biochemical reactions. And this time you don't have just fluid mechanics, you have you have, you have heat transfer, you have mass transfer, and a lot of chemical reactions uh, going on at the same time. And uh, let's, let's look at some of the work that we have done in this domain. So this is a paper that is published, that we published in, in Bioresource Technology by Elsevier uh, in January this year. And uh, this, this work was done in collaboration with the University of New Mexico, USA. So what you have, uh, there are two images, if you can observe, image A and image B. And image A is a basically a positively skewed surface. So when there is water moving on top of this surface, the dynamics of the water will be different than the dynamics of the water when it moves on surface B, which is negatively skewed. And what, what the researchers wanted to do, they wanted to understand why, why do they see growth of microbial communities or bacteria more on surface B compared to surface A. And that's why they came to us uh, to, to understand why this is happening using, using computational fluid dynamics. And we used open foam uh, to simulate the processes that they're observing in lab. And we found out that the surface B has more, has larger area with high shear stresses. And it is known previously from experimental data that larger uh, areas with large shear stresses lead to larger growth of microbial communities, and then that that basically explains why they were explain they were getting a more and more bacteria accumulation in, in surface B compared to surface A. Uh, this is uh, not as commonly used in CFT, but nevertheless, uh, I'm sure people are people are using it in. In, in power plants and chemical reactors, uh, what, what they want to do with fluidized beds is they want to force the solid fluid mixture to behave basically like a fluid. And this is achieved by the introduction of pressurized fluid uh, through, through the solid particulate medium. And what, 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 this, what this does is forces the medium 
to have properties and characteristics like a fluid so that you know when 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 the fluid and the solid move under free flow they all move uh, together and uh, and this will become more clearly if i show the animation here so the black is fluid and then from the bottom they are injecting inje i am we are injecting a uh, pressurized air and this is a simulation using open foam we are injecting pressurized air from the bottom and uh, and you can see that the solid and the fluid mixture are kind of moving in sync with each other next one is uh, reaction kinetics uh, like i said uh, this is predominantly used at least in water from from the water environmental context it's used a lot in wastewater treatment plants but it is also used uh, massively in aerospace and automotive industry for combustion um and the idea is a wastewater treatment what you do primarily you want to remove contaminants from wastewater using biochemical reactions so what you see on the bottom right image here is the shape of a contact tank so your water goes in this serpentine path or your sewage water goes through the serpentine path and as it moves along this path uh, a lot of chemical reactions happen and your water basically gets disinfected by the time it escapes this this con contact tank um and this is what we want to show in this in this uh, animation as well what you have is c5h7o2n which is a representation chemical representation for bacteria or microorganism and we are we are basically simulating two equations here the first equation on top is removal of bacteria using hocl which is hypochlorous acid which is formed when chlorine gas is injected is, is is reacted with water and the second one we want to remove ammonia using hocl right and uh, we are using irrever for for chemical engineers here uh, they will identify that we are using irreversible arrhenius equation for for reaction kinetics and we have heat transfer fluid dynamics mass transfer surface tension and many other physics uh, interface tracking and many many other physics activated at the same time so what you see uh, in the animation on on the bottom right part of the animation you have the inlet and and your bacteria is coming in with other pollutants and water and by the time it reaches the outlet which is the left half of the of the animation uh left portion of the animation you can see that the that the uh concentration of bacteria is is reducing so it's going from yellow to green okay and uh, of course when the chemical reactions happen you have a lot of products uh, that are formed so you have nh2cl forming ammonium carbonate i think it's ammonium bicarbonate uh, hcl water and co2 what you see on the screen here is carbon monoxide formation so as it as more as 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 the reactions get more and more time to react you can see more and more carbon dioxide is formed uh, closer to the exit of this of this contact tank and the last part of of the physics is non newtonian flows remember the top top part of that pyramid uh and what we are going to show here in this non newtonian uh, flows is a validation for a it's not a validation it's a it's a simulation simulation because we don't have experimental data for this it's a canadian red cris copper mine uh, from from british columbia and what you see in the image is is a reservoir of mining waste and it's white in color because of snow or ice i feel and uh, on the downstream of this image you have a dam with some roads uh, formation uh, with some roads artificially constructed for carrying equipment and vehicles and what we did in this study we we made an hypothetical situation that what if if, if what if this dam breaches what will be the impact of this uh, reservoir full of copper waste uh on the on the downstream valleys um and uh, sometimes this this waste could potentially be radioactive and in many cases definitely toxic toxic so you don't want such such events to happen so what you see in the animation here is Uh, let me let me take you to the beginning of the animation and pause it so this is the initial location of your reservoir the yellow part the copper mine waste and suddenly the dam breach happens and you can see how 
how your copper waste is is getting spread in the downstream valleys and causing impact and what you have on the left half uh, left image on this screen is is the actual terrain uh, near the near the red crest copper mine uh, that we again picked up from google earth and, and you can see the spread of uh, copper mine waste all over the ter terrain and we are using herschel berkeley model uh, for those of you who are aware for this for this type of modeling okay uh, now that we are done with all the work that we have done in the past, uh, a quick update on our upcoming webinars. Uh, and this is based on a lot of feedback from people uh, all over the world. Uh, so we are working a lot on additive manufacturing simulations uh, using OpenFoam. We are really excited about that. And we will have a webinar on that next, most likely. We will have another webinar where we talk about uh, interface tracking solvers and validations uh, that, has, that our R&D team has done using OpenFoam. We'll talk about sediment scar modeling using OpenFoam. Uh, another big one was uh, how to use artificial intelligence in CFD, how to uh, integrate it with CFD. We'll do one on that. Aerospace and defense modeling using OpenFoam. And lastly, uh, HVAC modeling using OpenFoam. So HVAC is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. We are also conducting some workshops by Pandav. This is again uh, based on a lot of uh, feedback we have got from students and personally being, being global head of academic programs uh, for, for the last five years. Uh, I, for, I felt this could be useful for, for truly proliferating CFT among masses. Uh, so it will be a two-day workshop called CFT with OpenFoam. Uh, there will be multiple dates uh, for you to pick from. And the topics that we will cover will include CFD, Linux operating system. Uh, of course, it will include OpenFoam, uh, CAD, meshing, data visualization, scientific computing, uh, industry application, and, and all the other rele relevant stuff. Uh, one, point I, one, one point I want to highlight is this will not be just a general introduction to OpenFoam. We'll actually uh, teach you or train you in a way that you'll find it applicable directly to your to your current area of research or industry and and this 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 these type of workshops could be helpful for even industry people to migrate uh, from one cfd software to open foam like i said the workshop will be uh, for two days uh, first day we'll do basic cfd with open foam but second day will be dedicated to industry specific cfd with open foam so if you're a person who has a background in aerospace engineering, the second day will be dedicated to aerospace, or if you are from water and environmental engineering or civil engineering, the second day will be dedicated to that. And the first day will be basic CFT with OpenFoam. So the next two upcoming dates are on August 28, 29. So it's a two-day webinar and September 4th and 5th, and it's Saturday and Sunday, so that more and more people can join. The registration form and details, uh, are in the description below, uh, below this YouTube video. And I hope that many of you people will like uh, what we are offering here. All right, uh, this is it from my end. And uh, please feel free to contact support at pandav.com if, if you want to migrate to OpenFoam, if you have any CFD consulting projects for us, uh, for CFD training, AI optimization, uh, product design, technology development, and prototyping. Thank you very much. And in the next, next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, we will uh, be taking some questions. And uh, you, can, you can put in your questions in the chat below. Okay, I see there are a lot of questions already. Um, okay, a lot of comments. Um, somebody asked, will you get a certificate? Yes, you'll get a certificate after the workshop training. 
Um, then Prasant Karidla asks, which type of dynamic motion solver used for train aerodynamic simulations? So we do use uh, dynamic uh, meshing for that, and there's a lot of settings. Uh, we can you can probably shoot an email to support at pandav.com. We'll share the details with you. Um, can you explain what do you exactly mean by WAF one, WAF two, hybrid WAF? Did I miss the explanation? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of geometric and algebraic manipulations that have been done to track the interface accurately, and that's the main difference between WAF 1, WAF 2, hybrid WAF, uh, which was outside the scope of this presentation. Um, but feel free to shoot an email, and we'll get back to you. Uh, Prasant Karedla says he's been using it since 2008. Good to know that. Um, Bubble rise case depends on Morton number. Yes, you're right. Bubble rise depends on Morton number, and there are actually three numbers that we are using uh, to validate this, and uh, we will be actually publishing this research uh, in 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 one of the journals, and you will be able to see it there. See the see the results there. Can you perform open form DM simulation? Yes, we can do DM simulations in open form using using an external solver, which is again open source as well. I'll be happy to take more questions. Sure. In fact, uh, in fact, the Nacelle simulation that I showed was was a CHT using a CHT solver. But I didn't elaborate on that in this in this webinar. We will cover the CFD DM coupling in our webinar on additive manufacturing. So when we do that webinar, we'll, we will uh, try to include more on CFD and DM. We, we do have a couple of slides on that. If you, if you, if you follow our LinkedIn page, uh, you will you will be notified when that webinar is coming out yeah i i have seen the electrochemical reaction solver somewhere uh in the list of open form solvers but i have not personally used them
but that's the that's the beauty with open form if you need if you need it for a specific application you can uh, code it up uh, you can modify the source code uh, if you are at that level and if not you can ask somebody else to do it and you can make it make it customizable to your exact application I have no idea that does sound like an interesting job position. All right, guys, thank you very much for attending the webinar. And please do send all your questions to support at pandav.com. And if you're interested, sign up for the webinar, future webinars and workshops. And I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you very much. Bye.